Hello everyone, we're outdoors, uh, we're socially spacing, uh, so please excuse me but I'm going to take the mask off uh, just uh, to make sure that, that you can hear me properly. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let me welcome you all uh, to the uh, launch of our uh, 16th Ugandan Economic Update. Uh, we do this economic update uh, usually twice a year. Uh, we're now about uh, 12, almost a year into the COVID uh, crisis, so this is our opportunity to share with you uh, our assessment of how the Ugandan economy has been coping in, in the light of this uh, crisis, uh, but also it's an opportunity for us to update you on how the, uh, how the government is responding and uh, what the impact has been on the government's budget. So I look forward to that. In addition, every time we do an update, we, we always focus on a special topic. And our special topic for this update is, is Uganda's future, not the future next year or five years, 20, 30, 40 years uh, fr from now. Uganda's got one of the youngest populations in the world, but let me share some figures with you. It's a projected to increase in the next 20 years to around 74 million people uh, from an estimated 46 million people today, and more than double to around 104 million Ugandan by, by 2060. So we at World Bank uh, Uganda believe that the real future, the most important part of Uganda's future, is its young people and what happens to its young people. And we believe it's absolutely critically important that the country invests heavily uh, in those young people, in their education, in, in their skills, uh, in their health. So, uh, so we look forward to, uh, to sharing with you our thoughts, our analysis on, on this. Uh, we trust you'll find it interesting. Uh, I look forward now to hearing the presentation from our team and look forward to an excellent discussion uh, with our panelists today. Welcome again and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, we will start this launch with a presentation on the state of the economy, slow growth in uncertain times. And Richard Walker, a senior economist with the World Bank, will be sharing those insights. Richard Walker is a senior economist at the World Bank. He also served as principal economist and coordinator Somalia Infrastructure Fund at the African Development Bank. Thanks very much, Josephine. I'll just remove this as well. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the 16th edition of the World Bank's Uganda Economic Update with a special topic on investing in Uganda's youth. Our presentation today will be split in two parts. Part one, State of the Economy, I'll run through five messages. Part two, Investing in Uganda's Youth, my colleagues Karan Aziz will run through a further three messages. Part one, State of the Economy. The COVID-19 pandemic has devastated the global economy. As this chart shows, the red line, the global economy is set to contract by about 5.2% in 2020, which is far lower than the projected growth of 2.5% in January this year. This is not surprising given that over 90% of economies are in recession this year, which is the highest number in recession over the last 150 years. Uganda hasn't been this spared this, sh this shock, and growth has plummeted, and a slow recovery is, ex recovery is expected. As you can see from this chart, which shows quarterly growth in Uganda, you can see that from the first quarter of this year, growth started slowing down, and by the second quarter, the economy was contracting, and through that quarter, contracted by about 6%. There seems to be some signs of recovery in the third quarter, but this is still early days. As a result, real GDP growth is expected to contract in 2020 by up to 1% compared to 7.5% growth in 2019. Looking at fiscal year data, we see that growth in FY20, fiscal year 20, was slowed down to about 2.8% compared to almost 7% growth in fiscal year 19. What's interesting though is you see um, the significant decline in industry and services as shown by the columns and the area of those columns contributing to growth compared to agriculture, which still grew relatively robustly. Looking forward, we expect growth of about 2 to 3% in fiscal year 21 and 4 to 6% in fiscal year 22, basically a downside and a baseline scenario. However, where Uganda ends up in, this in between these scenarios is dependent on a number of factors. Firstly, the spread of the COVID virus, Secondly, the availability of a, of a vaccine, the impact of the elections 
on economic activity, particularly over the next fiscal year. The recovery in the, the oil price and the implications this will have for investment in the Ugandan economy. And the recovery of trade and tourism. So just to unpack this briefly, Uganda has been impacted through several external channels. As the black line shows, exports have declined by over 3% of GDP and a moderate recovery is expected. As the blue line shows, there's been a significant fall in foreign investment from about 1.25 billion in FY19 to about 950 million in FY21. And as the red line shows, there's been a significant fall in tourism and the outlook for the tourism sector is highly uncertain. At the same time, there was a sudden fall in remittances in the second quarter of 2020. And this is concerning given that several households in Uganda rely on this as a, as a main source of income. With the high levels of vulnerability, poverty w w is set to rise. As the population continues to grow and the economy slows down, real per capita GDP has changed to a lower trajectory, as shown by this chart. In, in fact, in per capita terms, real GDP will contract for the first time in a decade by about 4.5%. As a result, COVID-19 looks set to reverse the poverty gains of the last 15 years. In addition, the goal of reaching real per capita GDP of $1,301 by FY25, as, as determined under the National Development Plan, the third National De Development Plan, is certainly questionable. Unpacking this further with some survey data we have, we find that incomes have dropped and this chart on the left shows uh, households with no or less earnings by main income source in August this year, the change compared to, to June. And in June, these households were even worse off than they were in March. As you can see, across these four main income sources, about 50% or more of households still had no or less earnings than they did in June. At the same time, though, social safety nets have been limited. There's, but there's been some food support, and there's been other kind, in-kind transfers, such as soap and masks. But when we're looking at direct cash transfers, in June and August, only 1% of households uh, mentioned that they'd received any form of direct cash transfer, which is concerning um, given the high levels of vulnerability to poverty and the limited social safety nets. Although employment has largely recovered, as shown by this chart, which firstly you have uh, the, the blue line, the blue columns, which show the situation in March. There was a decline to the gray column in June. And then there was this increase in August. This is the share of respondents working. At the same time, labor has shifted sectors. So the chart on the right shows employment by main economic sector. And you find that there's been an increase from March this year, where about 50% of respondents were working in agriculture, to August this year, where about 60% of these respondents were working in agriculture. So COVID-19 is threatening to reverse some of the gains in structural transformation, including the shift to off-farm employment. This brings me to the, another key message in the report, that fiscal sustainability concerns are growing. This chart shows over the last decade the performance of total expenditure, the orange line, tax revenue, the gray line, and then the fiscal deficit, the blue columns below. As you can see from about FY19, the orange line really starts increasing quite considerably. This is total expenditure as a share of GDP. At the same time, the gray line remains relatively flat. This is tax revenue as a share of GDP. And as a result of this divergence, you see this growth in the fiscal deficit. And for this fiscal year 21, this deficit is, uh, is likely to reach around 8% which is far higher than the target that has been set under the Charter for Fiscal Responsibility of less than 3% by FY21. And this doesn't take into account the, um, the additional 3.7 trillion of supplementary budget requests that have, that have been approved now in FY21. Given the situation, you find there's, this, there's been a sharp rise in public debt, as shown by this chart. At the end of the year, at the end of this fiscal year, public debt is expected to reach almost 50% of GDP, which is a sharp increase from 
where it was at the end of fiscal year 15 of just over 25% of GDP. We expect going into the fiscal year 2022 that this will even exceed the threshold of debt to GDP of 50% in nominal terms, a commitment that government had made would not be exceeded in order to ensure that debt remains sustainable. Currently, the IMF and the World Bank are undertaking a debt sustainability assessment. And following this, Uganda may not still be at the low risk of debt distress. Risks to debt sustainability are real. Slower growth, prolonged COVID-19 spending, and further delays to the final investment decision in the oil sector are real risks to this outlook. At the same time, Uganda already faces heightened liquidity risks, as shown by this chart. Uganda spends about 40% of revenue to service its debt, which is quite significant given that it's higher than the ratio in many countries at even high risk of debt distress, as shown by this chart. Now in this economic update, <coughs> we touch on a number of areas to try and turn this situation around. I'll just highlight one quickly. Uganda needs to urgently enhance domestic revenue mobilization. As this chart, chart shows, it compares the performance of Uganda to peers in terms of tax performance as a share of GDP. You can see that the red bar at the bottom being Uganda between 2015 and 18 is below the sub-Saharan African average of about 13%. It's quite significantly below neighbors Kenya and Rwanda, which are close to 16%. And the performance is well below the target under the domestic revenue mobilization strategy of about 16%. This brings me to the final message of part one. The economic outlook is not favorable and risks loom large. I've already discussed that growth is expected to be between 2 to 3% this fiscal year, increasing to about 4 to 6% next fiscal year. At the same time, inflationary pressures are rising. We expect an improvement in exports and foreign direct investment. I've mentioned the expansion in the fiscal deficit, which in time will have to be consolidated, and the fact that public debt is likely to exceed 50% of GDP by FY22. However, risks loom large to this outlook. Firstly, there's the coronavirus and weather-related shocks, which are always a, a problem in Uganda, a potential problem. Then you have the uncertainty related to the elections and what this might mean for economic activity and investment. You have the debt situation, which I've already discussed. And then you have international and regional factors. How quickly will global trade and travel recover? When will remittances recover? And finally, there's a risk posed by the oil price. This chart shows that the oil price has largely been well below the, the estimated production break-even price in Uganda for most of this year. A low price, of course, is good for the real economy and the trade balance. But in terms of reaching an investment decision in the oil sector, it's not great. So although the picture that's been presented is relatively gloomy in this economic update, there have been a number of green shoots. Firstly, the digital economy. Ugandans have certainly found ways of doing business and living their lives through this crisis. And secondly, I've talked already about the robust growth in agriculture and certainly the great potential for agro-industrialization going forward in Uganda. Critical, however, to both these sectors are the youth. My colleagues will talk more about part two, investing in Uganda's youth. Well, thank you very much, Richard. I'm just going to take off my mask so I can be heard uh, loud and clear. But Richard, to be honest, the projections that you've just shared with us make for depressing reading and listening to. It seems that any positive gains from the past years, uh, from what you've been showing us, have been eroded. But some of the highlights that jumped out at me, and just to be sure I got this right as I took some notes while you spoke, Uganda is set to experience an economic contraction, and I assume that means negative uh, economic growth to the non-technical person. Um, foreign investment and tourism almost dried up. The transport sector and manufacturing took a hit. Construction fared better compared to the others. Perhaps the only positive trends that we see are in agriculture and in ICT. We have oil revenues, if they start coming in, which are unlikely to ease the economic distress given the low price on the global market and projected tax revenues have to be revised downwards due to weak economic activity. D did I get that right, Richard? Let me just take this off again. Thanks, yeah. Josephine. No, I think, so the one thing I would just clarify is, in terms of economic growth, 
For the year 2020, the calendar year, yes, we expect a contraction of the economy. Okay. But in terms of fiscal years, we don't see a contraction yet. So the last fiscal year ending in, in June 2020, uh, the growth was still positive, and we expect, expect still positive growth in the next fiscal year. But what we also do say is if you're looking at uh, real GDP per capita, so growth per person, given the, the high population growth, we find that to be negative. So that's shifted downwards. All right. Um, we'll be joined um, in this discussion by Dr. Asumani Glova. Asuman Glova is the Director of Development Planning at the National Planning Authority. He has worked previously as an economist with the World Bank in Uganda and in Zambia. Uh, it's good to have you, Dr. Asumani. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. You're welcome. And also, um, the country director for the World Bank has joined us for this conversation. Anthony Thompson is the World Bank country manager for Uganda. Prior to the assignment in Uganda, Thompson was the country manager for Bulgaria, the Czech Republic and Slovakia since August 2014. He also served as the manager for strategy and operations at the Human Development Network, based at the World Bank Group in Washington, D.C. My question to the three of you who are um, in this field, the government has to tighten its belt. There's you know, no other way to say that there's going to be less money coming in. What are the main ways that the government can curb expenditure? So Josephine, I'm, I've got some ideas on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when we provided budget support to the government earlier this year, part of the agreement was that they would sign up for this uh, debt service suspension uh, initiative, which is available to about 70 countries. And, uh, and they did that. Uh, but uh, they need to follow through uh, to actually get the debt relief uh, from uh, their, uh, their bilateral creditors. That'll be worth about potentially $90 million this year, uh, with even more uh, potentially uh, next year. So that's a quick, a quick win there. I think it's really important at this stage for the government to do whatever it can to avoid taking on non-concessional debt. It's a non-concessional debt that really uh, creates this huge debt service um, uh, burden. And when the fiscal is so tight, uh, then it's, it, it's very easy to end up having, having to go down that path. Um, when they, well with the expenditure they are making, it's very important they prioritize that to um, economy boosting expenditure. So uh, expenditure that will put money into the economy and, uh, and, um, and, and uh, give a direct boost. Uh, also, I think it's very important this time when so many people are falling into poverty to do whatever's possible to stop them becoming destitute. Yeah. Uh, because once you're destitute, it's very hard to bounce back from that. And then finally, I think it's a real priority to get the children back into education, not necessarily school because there are all these uh, precautions that have to be taken, but make sure that children are getting back on track in, in terms of their education because well, whatever they lose out there, they lose out for forever. Well, that's absolutely true. Um, Richard, do you want to yeah. add to that? Yeah, I'll just say, I mean, I think in terms of this, what we've been surprised about this fiscal year is, is the high share of supplementary budgets that have already gone through. Um, it's higher than already at this point in the year than the last four or five years. It's already almost 10%, getting close to 10% of the approved budget. Um, and quite a high share of that has been on, on, on classified spending. So I think there certainly is there's scope for revisiting some of the budget priorities and perhaps trying to rationalize. Okay. Um, well, Dr. Glover, you, you are here with us and from the National Planning Authority. Would you add to what has just been suggested? Uh, Josephine, thanks. Uh, what I would say before I even add anything, uh, you don't waste <coughs> a good crisis because with every crisis there's an opportunity. And for me the opportunity here is to curb government expenditure in a way that is smart. And what this implies is that uh, the way we are being spending uh, uh, wastefulness is should stop. And w this implies that uh, issues related to the consumptive nature of our budgets, uh, these must stop. One of them, some of them, you are seeing them already, particularly in terms of the way we have been consuming a lot of workshops, uh, a lot of uh, travel. travel abroad. Okay. Now, this crisis is, is an opportunity for us to make sure mm -hmm. these things going forward we get a smart way of using our money. Secondly, even this, uh, uh, if we are to use this example, we could have been now in a hotel uh, uh, trying to, to, to have this conversation, but because of the digital way, the workshops that we have been spending on money need to stop. Yeah. So because of that, they, there is a room. They, uh, this crisis can give us an opportunity mm -hmm. to do the hard things that we have been failing to do. Secondly, 
the way we do projects needs to be smart. And th this implies uh, public investment management, they will prepare a project, execute it, uh, uh, and prioritize for that project has to be smart. To Thomas talk to what Tony is saying, we, we must be smart in the projects we are looking for. Look for the projects that have higher impact to make sure that uh, we come out of this, uh, of this uh, uh, crisis that we are in. Uh, uh, lastly, to this is that uh, the bigger issue that, uh, that we are facing in government in terms of uh, 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 curbing expenditure is making government efficient. And uh, these conversations we are having then within government, how do we make this government efficient? Probably to ultimately mean we really think about restructuring and making it the administrative costs a bit leaner. And, uh, and that conversation is going on with, within government. If we achieve that, over time we'll be able to save a lot of resources over time, in addition to what Tony and Richard have talked to. Those are very difficult decisions to make, but I think those are decisions mm -hmm. that have to be made. Yeah. Um, government will want to stimulate economic resurgence. What are some of the ways in which this could be better done with even less resources? Um, yeah. If I go first, uh, uh, for me, if you look at economic resurgence, one thing that uh, uh, this crisis hit, it hit mainly the, the private sector of the economy. The private sector of the economy almost collapsed, meaning the role of government is, is, <coughs> is has to be uh, heightened more than ever in order to, and this I can talk to it on two fronts. The first front is the way it supports the private sector to recover will be very key. Secondly, the way it, it spends its own money must be efficient to be able to boost the, this private sector. So to s I I around these areas, each of them have ways, and I've already alluded to, to some of them, is that uh, uh, smart government that we are spending will be very key. The areas that we look for, it shouldn't be just business as usual. We should be looking for areas that have a, a larger impact on, on boosting the economy as we are spending the minimum resources that we have. Uh, secondly, uh, as we go out to support the private sector, uh, the, because the private sector is the biggest driver of this economy, it has to be supported in a way because it has almost deteriorated, uh, it has almost disappeared. We must look for areas, particularly in using the cost of credit, things that are, are failing them, uh, 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 social protection, because uh, uh, in the informal sector, uh, they are really struggling. Uh, and uh, when we start hearing about even why people take these things to be political issues, things like related to Emioga, Emioga is actually social protection to those uh, air salons that are struggling within uh, the youth that are struggling within the country. Uh, to, to because now government's law <coughs> is now more than ever yeah, yeah. because uh, of that missing link because the private sector had totally collapsed. But the message home here, how smart is government to make sure that we do that role very well in order to boost the economy. Right. Yeah. Tony? So this one's put some great ideas uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the table. One of the challenges uh, for us at World Bank is thinking, well, how do we support uh, the country at this time? And uh, there are, we've been uh, putting money in to support the immediate needs, uh, things like uh, the essential um, supplies for the health sector, uh, PPEs, uh, testing uh, kits and, and those kind of things. That's absolutely essential. But at the same time, we're trying to think, well, how do we keep our eye also on the medium to long term? and make sure that those things aren't being lost as well. So we've also been looking at uh, trying to uh, find ways to maintain the original plans to put finance into such important future parts of the economy as, for example, the digital. Uh, ICT has been one of the bright spots in this. Yeah. Uh, we want to help um, Uganda continue on that path of uh, transformation. Uh, so we see an opportunity to, uh, to invest there. Uh, we've, we, we've seen that the more that we've uh, invested there. The actually, things like the cost of data has been plummeting in, in Uganda, and we see that as an immediate knock-on effect uh, for for everybody um, in the in the uh, country. Um, we're looking at uh, ways uh, to support transformation of agriculture. A lot of people moving back to the farms, but productivity is still very low. Per capita GDP is falling. Uh, we're perhaps going to lose 15 years of uh, poverty reduction at at, at, at achievement. So, so helping. Uh, the uh, the uh, transformation of, of agriculture is, is going to be very important as well. Uh, th 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 there are a few other things, but those are just a few ideas. All right. Mm -hmm. well, thanks for that. Um, Richard, do you want to respond to that as well, or can, can I uh, send the next question to you to start with? Um, one of the things that we need to critically think about is engaging the citizens, and they have a bigger role in rebuilding the economy. 
how can government ease the economic activity of its citizens? I think, I mean, l let me pick up on the whole agriculture. Yeah. I think, as I said in my presentation, it's it's been relatively robust. It's also seems to be a sector where people are moving back to, yeah. to support their livelihoods through this crisis. Mm -hmm. So I think that certainly is a place to start. The productivity of agriculture is critical. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the role for government there is important in terms of creating the space and creating the environment, and impro improving the conditions for people to farm, particularly moving into more commercial farming. And this will be both on the land, behind the farm gate, but beyond the kind of logistics, the storage capacity, uh, the markets, um, moving into, into the regional market and internationally. There's a lot of scope there to just improve the quality of what Uganda is improving. So, uh, and that maybe comes back to your first question as well. I, I don't think we need to think about a lot of things. I think we need to stay quite focused yeah. and be quite particular. And I think that whole agriculture, agro-industrialization agenda is very important. And it certainly is on the radar, of course, of everyone in this country. But I still think there's, there's a lot that can be done to sort of improve the leadership, the management, uh, the consolidation of the kind of players who are involved there, um, so that certainly when you get down to the level of the farmer, their lives are a whole lot easier and more productive and clearer in terms of, of the kind of inputs they can source, as well as then the obvious markets that they can sell to. Right. And then uh, when you think about the, what has survived uh, COVID-19, agriculture and ICT, mm. putting those two together could be a huge boost for the economy. I'll, I'll just ask um, uh, Dr. Glover if you could just wrap up for us what you want to take home from this conversation in one minute, and then I'll ask Tony the same in one minute, okay. and then I'll, I'll close uh, it with you. Me, in one minute is the, the National Development Plan that has, so far, that has just been launched, that we are implementing gives a blueprint what we should be doing. And uh, to tie up with uh, what uh, Richard and Tony are saying, uh, is that agri-end association is very key. And there is a reason why. Because the uh, private sector, again, as I said, drives this growth. In the Uganda, 80% of employment, 80% of, of jobs, 80% uh, of uh, tax revenues. It is key. And the, key the, the biggest private area is agri-end association. The, what we are doing differently uh, is that uh, where in the past we are looking at ag agriculture in on its own from a production side, we are trying to look at it from the entire value chain because that was the missing link, connecting these dots. One, farmers produce, there's no market for them. Uh, when there is market for them, uh, post-harvesting is wrong because we, lose, we are losing 30% of the produce. Yeah. So as government, we need to look at that entire chain to make sure that we boost the economy going forward. Thank you. Tony? Josephine, this uh, country has, with, has experienced a huge shock to, uh, to the system. Uh, it is really a, a crisis situation. Uh, there's a real risk that many people will get left behind. I think it's important for society as a whole and for government also to be watching out for those people uh, so that the, the country can move forward uh, uh, together. Uh, but also, more than ever, and with resources scarcer than, that than ever, then it's even more critical that, that government uh, chooses its investments and spends its money uh, very wisely, very strategically, and really aiming, aiming for the highest impact. And uh, like the second part of our, our, our report adv advocates, uh, it's really critically important, even in the middle of this crisis, to think about the um, importance of uh, in investing in Uganda's young people. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Tony. Richard? Yeah, I was going to end on a similar message to say, I mean, I, you talked about digital, you talked about agriculture. I think an important segment of Ugandan society are the youth, what they, their role in those, both those sectors, um, both their innovativeness and as well as their productivity in, in both sectors to try and drive growth um, and connecting a lot of things together. Um, so I'd say, and that's the reason why we've picked this as a special topic at this time, the country has taken a big hit, the youth have taken a big hit, I think human capital development has taken a big hit, and, and there's a lot of work to do quite quickly to, to ensure that we don't lose we don't fall too far off, off, the, off the path uh, of where Uganda was heading before the crisis. On the sidelines of the launch of the 16th World Bank Economic Update, I am sitting with Dr. Asuman Glover. Asuman Glover is the Director of Development Planning at the National Planning Authority. He has worked previously as an economist with the World Bank in Uganda and in Zambia. Welcome and thank you for taking the time. Uh, thank you, Josephine. Yeah. I'm happy to be here. Great. Just a, a few quick questions for you because I know we've already interacted. Where do you see citizen participation in rebuilding the economy, keeping in mind um, the report that we've, we're 
you're talking about? Uh, like I, I earlier said, is that uh, Uganda's economy is largely driven by the private sector. And I did tell you that 80% uh, of the economy is driven by the private sector. 80% of taxes are contributed to by the private sector. Uh, the jobs are mainly from the private sector. But the other characteristics of these private sectors is largely informal in nature and small uh, in agriculture. So the way you see, the way I'm seeing citizen participation is whatever we do around agriculture, particularly addressing the ag agriculture value chains. Uh, also issues related to uh, uh, how we bring in the youth because the majority of the Ugandans, the private sector is actually the youth. How we harness the youth to be able to drive this economy is the way to go. So what government needs to do is to make sure with those characteristics in place, how do we play a key role to make sure this private sector is able to drive the economy. Issues related to sorting out cost of doing business, uh, issues related to sorting out the, the, the cost of credit, uh, uh, and then having a good environment that is able to harness them to deliver, particularly around the, now that we are faced with COVID, uh, have giving them a helping hand, a, sub, a helping hand to handhold them to deliver is the way to go. Right, when you spoke about COVID, um, brings me to two issues that yeah. uh, keep coming out of the report, health and education. Yeah. COVID is uh, co uh, clearly health, but also economy. And I, I wanted to f you to sh share with us thoughts on how do we support the youth, keeping in mind their health and education that they need to for secure the future of the country. Uh, like I earlier said, and uh, I did tell you we need a, a, a deeper conversation, particularly around the, the National Development Plan today. Because the majority of these questions that you are posing are, are detailed in, what in the National Development Plan Theory. And the, what the National Development Plan Theory does is that it's about to need to rebalance uh, the way we invest as government, particularly looking at the people, uh, in, a, in addition to what we have been doing in, in terms of infrastructure, being the foundation of the economy. But looking at the people in particular as a person, the human capital development, it has issues related to education and health. And the, uh, the approach that we are suggesting is, is a bit different from what we have been doing in the past. For instance, uh, around the education, it's not more about the access to education alone. It's now more to quality of education. And this has implications. If you are to get, uh, as I earlier told you, that majority of our youth, uh, majority of our operation is just the youth. The, the way we invest in them will be key of us harnessing the demographic dividend going forward. So here, education plays a very key role, but not just access to education, which uh, government has achieved. Uh, it, we are doing very well, but now it, we have to shift to make to ensure that the quality of education becomes key. Okay. So this ties around the quality of teaching, quality of teachers. Instead of us teaching people to memorize and cram, we need, for, we need them to learn a skill. So this becomes key. When it comes to health, uh, as, as a government, there is a lot that has been achieved, particularly in ensuring that infrastructure is in place. Uh, uh, at least 85% of Ugandans are in five kilometer radius of, of a health facility. So now the next question in any deficit that we need to address is ensuring that these health factors func are functional and they are providing quality health services. Yeah. If we do that, then we'll be able to harness that private sector, particularly the youth, to be able to drive the, the, the economy. When we speak about uh, pop our population growth, our projected population growth for the next years to yeah. come, we're now at about 46 million. We are heading towards 70 million, and after that, we're heading towards over 100 million. I is this something, how should we take this information? Uh, uh, for us, Josephine, that information is the basis why we plan, and the basis why we, we, we sleep every night, you are dreaming about it. How do you harness this population? Because this population growth is, is a blessing, it's a, an opportunity, but can also be a curse, it can be a challenge if you don't invest in it very well. Uh, uh, it's a blessing because uh, on two fronts, it can provide the demand you are looking for to, to build the entire economic activity. Uh, uh, then it will, it, this will be the drive of investments. But it can also be a blessing in terms of providing the necessary labor, as long as this productive labor. But if you don't invest in it very well, it becomes a challenge. 
And you, you can even see what is happening now, the recent rights that we are having. It's because now focus is how do we deal with these rights. It's mainly making sure we invest in this population very well. We create the jobs to make sure everybody is, is well. We get the economy to be broad based to work for everybody. And that's the focus that the government is moving into to make sure it harnesses this population, particularly investing in, in creating jobs, one, uh, in, uh, creating, uh, investing in, in, in this population in, in, in education and health. But more importantly, there's another missing link when we talk about this, particularly in the youth. There are those youth who, from, uh, if you look at the pyramid of the population, uh, you have from uh, the age zero to four big, uh, then you have uh, from uh, 6 to 10, we, these are the biggest pyramid uh, where our population falls. So the, the way you approach that is mainly through education and health, through the life cycle approach, looking for them from the time they are born to the time they will join the market. So education becomes key. But, but there is another part which is a challenge even now today. The ones who fall between uh, 18 to 20 to 25 to 30, the youth. Now those also, might, might some of them are educated, they are looking for jobs. There are those, even if you did good education, they can never go back to school. So the, the, the way you approach that is totally different. So you need to, to look at them. Uh, all of them, you have to embrace them. With those who require more skills, there are those who are already in saloon work. And that's why you see government is going to some areas focused through this, particularly when you hear things related to yoga, that kind of things, to mainly target those who already they employed somewhere, they are earning very little, how do we maximize whatever they are doing, handhold them to be able to to, uh, to, 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 to survive sun on their foot. Mm -hmm. Then the others is industrialization, create, the economy should create jobs for them to fit in, but even agriculture, how, uh, how is agriculture productive for them to earn a little bit more from wherever they are, whatever they are doing. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Asman Glover, for taking the time to speak with us and share some insights in the report and what Uganda can actually do. The pressure is mine. The pressure is mine. Thank right. you, Josephine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick, for sharing your insights. Thank you, Thank you very much, Tony, for participating and Dr. Glover for your input as well. This has been part one of the World Bank economic update and we'll have part two where we'll be focusing on the youth and investing in them to play their part in economic recovery and future growth. Daily Monitor and KPMG in partnership with Uganda Investment Authority, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation and DFCU Bank presents the Uganda Top 100 Mid-Sized Companies Talk Show Dialogue with the experts Lawrence BNC, Acting Director General, Uganda Investment Authority, Robert Wanok, Head Personal and Business Banking, DFCU Bank, Basil Aja, Director, Techpreneurship, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation and Oscar G. of Kumbi, Director, Serve My SME. Tune in and get advice on how to resource for efficiency during the COVID-19 period live on NTV on Thursday, 3rd December 2020 at 3 p.m. The COVID-19 pandemic has slowed Uganda's economic growth with continued job losses and business closures. Household incomes have fallen. Policy actions in three areas are needed to support the vulnerable and promote a resilient recovery. First, Strengthen human capital and ensure that children return to school. Second, support and revive small businesses. And third, enhance transparent fiscal management. It's estimated that Uganda's population will increase to 104 million in 2060 from 46 million today. To ensure a productive workforce, investments in health and education need to be prioritized. However, recruiting teachers alone will not solve Uganda's problem of inadequate schooling. Teacher support and supervision should be strengthened to improve the quality of instruction. Over 70% of Uganda's disease burden is preventable. Investing in cheaper prevention measures can produce significant gains. Government also needs to better leverage non-state actors 
to provide health and education services. This is the 16th edition of the World Bank's Economic Update for Uganda. Invest in UG Youth. Hello once again and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the launch of the 16th World Bank Economic Update and this is part two of our series on the same. Today we'll be focusing on youth and investing in them to play their part in economic recovery and future growth. Aziz and Kara will be sharing insights and we'll get into a panel discussion on what they will have shared with us in youth participation. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Aziz Atamanov. I'm senior power economist for Uganda. And I and my colleague Kara and Myers are going to talk about the special focus of the 16th Uganda Economic Update, which is about importance of investing in Uganda's youth in order to capitalize on growing working age population in the country. And the analysis is heavily drawn from the World Bank report tackling the demographic challenge in Uganda. As you might know, Uganda is entering an important development stage called demographic transition, which is associated with a declining death and birth rates. And you can see them on the figure on the left. So uh, death is depicted by black line and birth rates are depicted by orange line. Both of them are falling, but since birth rates are still much higher than death rates, there will be a dramatic increase in total population as shown by increasing gray area. In particular, population in Uganda is expected to more than double between 2020 and 2060. However, what is even more important is that the age structure of population will change dramatically as well, as you can see from the figure on the right. It's called age pyramid, which shows the structure of population by age groups. You can see two years on the figure. Blue bars show 2020 year, and orange bars show 2016. And age pyramid in 2020 has a very broad base base. However, what is even more important is that the age structure of population will change dramatically as well as you can see from the figure on the right. It's called age pyramid, which shows the structure of population by age groups. You can see two years on the figure. Blue bars show 2020 year, and orange bars show 2016. And age pyramid in 2020 has a very broad base base, signaling about predominantly young population. However, by 2060, population will be predominantly working age. It's actually almost 70% of Uganda population will be between 15 and 70 years old. And it will imply that every year almost 1 million of young people will, will enter the labor market. So growing working age population can be beneficial for economic development only if it transforms into workers with high productivity who get better jobs, high quality jobs, and eventually this will generate economic growth. Unfortunately, there is no guarantee that this path will happen, and country uh, may very well uh, have workers with low productivity uh, who cannot uh, contribute to economic growth, who will be employed in low productive jobs like subsistence agriculture, and this can lead to stagnation. So a natural question to ask, what a country can do to choose the economic development path I just showed you in the previous slide? And an answer is that building capabilities is a necessary precondition for more productive workers who can uh, get better jobs and this will lead to economic growth and poverty reduction. And government can play a crucial role here by investing in education and health to help the youth and eventually growing working age population to acquire the skills and health necessary to be fully productive. So given this, uh, the main goal of our special focus is to quantify the fiscal effort needed to provide growing population with adequate education and health services. So this analytical exercise was based on two scenarios. First scenario is called business as usual, and the second scenario is called sustainable development goals. So let me walk you through both scenarios. So business as usual assumes no change in current 
quite low enrollment and health coverage rates. It also assumes uh, that the quality of services stays the same. And we know that this is far from perfect, and the quality varies substantially across different socioeconomic groups and geographic areas. So clearly, business as usual is very unlikely to ensure that Uganda's youth accumulates enough human capital to capitalize on demographic transition. Therefore, we introduce a second, quite ambitious scenario in line with sustainable development goals. So basically, it assumes universal access to primary and secondary education, and also universal health coverage by 2030. It also assumes improved quality in both sectors. When thinking about these two scenarios, it is important to remember that the COVID-19 crisis exacerbates existing challenges with access and quality of health and education services. So under these circumstances, it becomes even more important for the government to invest in human capital. So after setting the stage, let me pass the floor uh, to my colleague, Kara N. Myers, who will show you how much will it cost for Uganda to strengthen human capital to generate demographic dividend. Thank you. All right, so in this next section, we're going to take a closer look at the education and health sectors and the repercussions of the demographic change in Uganda on these sectors over the coming decades. So the first thing that we see is that enrollment in primary and secondary school is going to increase substantially over the coming years. We see that between now and 2060, there's going to be an increase of about a million students every five years. So that means by between now and 2025, we're looking at 1 million additional students from 15 million to 16 million. And with this increase in students, we're going to see a substantial increase in demand on the inputs for education, teachers, classrooms, textbooks, all of the inputs that are necessary to provide a basic education. Now, as was outlined previously, we have two scenarios. We have a business as usual scenario and a sustainable development goal scenario. What you'll see on these two charts on the right is that there's a blue line here at the bottom, and that's for the business as usual scenario. This shows the growth in teachers or classrooms that will be necessary just to maintain the current access rates to schooling and the quality. So this means that, for example, in secondary school, we only have about 30% of students attending secondary school, and we also have significant quality gaps persisting under this business as usual blue line, even though we still see an increase here because of the growing number of students, the growing number of young people. But what's more important to look at is this orange line on the top, and this really shows what will be necessary to achieve the sustainable development goals for education in Uganda, and especially at the primary and secondary level. And this entails increasing access rates which is particularly important for secondary school, so reaching basically universal enrollment by 2030 for secondary school, and increasing quality. And this is really important because that means that you're going to have an increase in teachers to improve the student-teacher ratio, an increase in classrooms to be able to manage class sizes, etc. So that's why you see the orange line really increasing substantially more over the next several decades. And just as an example, to be on track to reach the Sustainable Development Goals by 2025, Uganda will need 10,000 more secondary teachers per year and also need to double the number of secondary school classrooms. So it's a really a tremendous uh, increase in the basic inputs. As such, in this next slide, we see how there's going to be a significant increase in the investment that will be necessary to provide these inputs to the education sector. So whereas in 2019, the education budget was about 1.7% of GDP, by the 2020-2025 period, we're looking at 2.4% of GDP uh, under the Sustainable Development Goals scenario. And under the business as usual scenario, it's a little bit lower, 2% of GDP. However, as was just stated, that's really not going to be sufficient for Uganda to make the investment necessary to be on track to reach the Sustainable Development Goal scenario. So we are really looking more closely at this orange upper line. Now, these calculations, these projections of GDP were made before COVID, so perhaps there's going to be some adjustment there. But in any case, when we look at the dollar amount, we see a, this is going to be a substantial fiscal effort. We're looking at an increase of from 480 million 
in 2019 to almost 1 billion per year in the 2020-25 period. So really a substantial increase in fiscal resources going to education. And this is costly, but it's very important to note that when Uganda, if Uganda does not make these investments, it's also going to be costing the country. It's costing the country in terms of lost productivity, and it is not allowing Uganda's youth to really contribute to the economy as they should be. So for example, a child born in Uganda today is expected to be only about 38% as productive as she would be if she had full education and health. So you see that these investments really have large payoffs and that's why it's also important to prioritize this sector. The next slide, we're gonna look closer at the health uh, sector. And it's a very similar story as education, except that of course, we're not just looking at young people. Uh, we're looking at the general population and the growth of the general population and the demands on health services. So once again, you see a very a steady increase for both the business as usual, this is the blue line on the bottom, and the sustainable development goals scenario. So growing population, just to even keep access rates as they are, uh, you're going to need substantially more hospitals, hospital beds, uh, healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, midwives, et cetera. And under the business as usual scenario, that implies only a 44% coverage rate, which once again is not really sufficient for Ugandans to really have the health services that they need to make the most of their potential, which is why we're looking at this orange line for sustainable development goals, which implies a 90% coverage rate by 2030. And again, this is a substantial increase in the inputs. We're looking over the next five years at Uganda needing 20 additional general hospitals. That's five more hospitals every year between now and 2025. And it's a similar story with hospital beds, 12,000 more hospital beds in the next five years, almost 30,000 more healthcare personnel in the next five years. So really substantial demands on this sector to stay in line with the population growth. And as such, uh, this next slide shows the investment. Once again, going to require substantial increases in investment in the health sector to keep up with the growing population. So whereas in 2019, the health sector cost about 1.5% of GDP for the government's health budget, we're looking at 2020 for the sustainable development goals requiring 3.8% of GDP. So really a substantial increase more than doubling the projected annual budget for health. And while the blue line, the, the business you, as usual scenario is lower, again, I have to stress that that's not going to be sufficient for Uganda to maintain, to, to keep up with the growing population and improve coverage. So we're really looking at this orange line. And over time, we see that as a percentage of GDP, the health budget goes down. However, that's because of projected increases in GDP. As we look at this right-hand chart, uh, the millions of USD, the budget does continue to increase just because of the growing population. So kind of in summary, the key message that we're trying to get across here is the fact that Uganda really is in a key stage of its development path. You have a growing young population, soon to be working age population. And this working age population has the tremendous potential to contribute to the country's economic growth, to help the country really make the most and benefit from the demographic dividend, and really put Uganda on a better track for the future. However, these gains are not automatic. And most importantly, Ugandan youth need to have the education, the skills, and the health necessary to be fully productive and to access better jobs and there be more productive, successful entrepreneurs so that they can contribute to the economic growth uh, and the demographic change will be positive. As such, there's going to be substantial resources that must be mobilized now to make those investments in Uganda's future, in Uganda's youth now, so that the working age population will have the skills necessary. And because of that, I'd like to leave you guys with these following questions. We have questions about how is this going to happen? What is the repercussions on Ugandan society for these education and health sectors? The first question is, how do we increase the public and health 
public health and education funding for the sector, for the sectors. How do we increase the funding that is going to be necessary to be on track for the sustainable development goals scenario? How do we also implement a more cost-effective school and hospital construction strategy so that spending is utilized more effectively and more efficiently? Third, how do we bring in more private financing? How do we increase collaborations with non-state actors so that Uganda can blend both public and private financing? Third, how do we, or fourth, how do we raise the education standards in lagging regions and among underserved populations so that when these additional investments are made, they're also made in a way that is equitable and increases access in areas that currently have lower scores for education. Fifth, how do we revise the teacher and health worker utilization and deployment policies? How do we make sure that teachers are not absent from the classroom? How do we make sure that healthcare workers' time is used most efficiently and make sure that we're making the most of our human resources? And finally, once again, how do we make quality a central theme for health policy and education policy and make that a part of the financing and programmatic interventions that are conducted? So for more analysis and for a closer look at some of the calculations and the impact of the demographic change on these key sectors, I encourage you to take a look at the report published by the World Bank this year, tackling the demographic challenge in Uganda. And thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kara, and thank you, Aziz. From what we've just heard, Uganda has fared better than many countries, in part because of the young population that it has. We've not lost the same numbers that we've seen in Europe, for example. Younger people seem to have better odds of surviving the coronavirus. The presentation we just saw also emphasizes how this young population is key to economic resurgence post-COVID-19 and for future growth. But that young population has to be highly productive, uh, that is skilled and also motivated. This means that government should prioritize investment in human capital in two main ways, education and health. Which brings me to my panel for this uh, for our conversation. And I'll introduce them quickly. I'll start over there. Angela Bagine. Angela Bagine is a management consultant. She is currently serving as the chairperson of the East African Women in Business Platform Limited and the Uganda Women Entrepreneurs Association Board. She is also a board member of the Private Sector Foundation of Uganda and Femcom Commerce. Angela, you wear very many hats, so I've, I've chosen this particular one. I hope it suits our conversation. Yes, it does. All right. Uh, next to Angela is Commissioner Alex Asimwe. Alex Asimwe serves as the Commissioner Labor, Industrial Relations and Productivity in the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development. A social worker by profession, he was also the Director, Center for Disability and Rehabilitation. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you. All right. And also on this side of the panel, we have Dana Sekadja Bagarukayo. Dana Bagarukayo is an economist. She holds a master's degree in economic policy and planning and a bachelor's degree in statistics. She has a strong professional background in education and a passion for development, specifically focusing on the youth. She has worked for UNDP, the Dutch, Irish and EU embassies in various capacities and is currently working for the World Bank as an education specialist on high value education projects in Uganda. Right. So I'm going to throw my questions out to all of you and you can um, respond from your different um, areas and, and skilling areas. So training people in IT opens a lot of doors for them and we've seen that ICT has been you know, one of those areas that has survived and actually almost thrived during this period. The country stands to benefit from more IT expertise and to compete on the international stage. So apart from building the requisite IT infrastructure like cheap and accessible internet, what more can the government do on this front in terms of IT and the young people? I'll start with you, Commissioner. Um, first of all, um, we Ugandans need to know that uh, one of the government strategy to engage the youth, particularly to create jobs, but jobs that are productive, is to put uh, serious investments in four areas, industrialization, uh, agro-processing or agro-industrialization, 
development of services and the development of ICT. So it is already in the broader spectrum of government strategy to engage the youth. But what is it that we need to do now to us upscale the intervention? What we need to do is now to ensure that in all our schools, we are able to mainstream and integrate ICT services right away from primary up to education, up to the secondary university and tertiary. And that is being done. But also most importantly, we know very well that for the last 30 years, the government of Uganda has put more investment in what we call pedagogy education system. Teaching from the classroom perspective. Now we have realized that actually now we need again to put more investment from what we would call workplace setting perspective because we know that there are those young people who drop out of school and therefore may not have an opportunity for them to be in the pedagogy setting of labs, but they can be in the garages, in the carpentry workshops, and therefore it is now the government strategy that we develop what we call a work-based learning policy. So every enterprise would have what we would call a skilling model for the, for, the, for the workers, including the informal sector. This means that these young people who may not have an opportunity to have pedagogy setting learning, they can now learn from a workplace. And that's when we can now cover the entire young people to ensure that they are given an opportunity to have ICT. But also, you know very well that, uh, Josephine, the government of Uganda put in place what we call innovation fund, particularly for ICT. And uh, government continues to commit on the aspect of increasing this fund so that more young people can access those who have nice ideas, you know, innovative, they can apply and get this money and develop their ideas, and they are able to solve what we would call challenges that we face in today's business environment. Uh, Commissioner, uh, before I, I move on to somebody else, I, I know that innovation hubs are being set up even across the country. Do you want to give us an update on, on how far that's gone? Yes, the innovation hubs are, are being set up, and what we are looking at is to look at regional, these hubs. We are starting with the cities, the one in, in, in Kampala is almost, you know, getting, getting ready. But the, the, w what is key is for our leaders to really sensitize and ensure that the young people are aware of these interventions, like Innovation Lab. Because sometimes you can have these innovation hubs, Empty. ICT. And they are never used. Yeah. Reason being that people are not aware, the young people are not aware. So as government of Uganda puts you know, serious resources in this, I think what is more critical is to ensure that the young people are aware of this initiative so that they can take advantage and improve their ICT services. And that's absolutely, absolutely true. Um, just to pick from that, and I, I'll pose this question to Diana and Angela. When you look at the report, it focuses quite a bit on um, more teachers, more classrooms, and ensuring that a lot of young people have access to education. And it sounds great in terms of quantity, but not so much in terms of quality. In the grand scheme of things, don't we need to rethink our kind of quality of education altogether? When Commissioner Alex speaks about scheming, um, most and, and when he says it's pad padag pedagogy? Pedagogy, yes, yes. classroom. Yes. So we're going into the classroom and we're being taught all of these things and then we come out and u university students have no jobs. Should we be thinking about the quality of the education, what we're teaching them? Um, yes, technical schools and things like that. Yes, I can go first. Um, when we look in the context of this report in particular, we do focus on quality, but we've also emphasized quantity. Because um, from the report, we're saying that the population of Uganda is going to increase from 40 to about 70 million. And most of those are young people. So even before we begin to look at quality, we need to also look at increasing the number of classrooms that are available, um, increasing the number of teachers, 
that are available for this large population. So quality is important and, and it, uh, we're not uh, underplaying it, but we need to look at the fact that we need to increase on those, on those quantities. Okay. Um, so from this report, we're emphasizing that, um, yes, we need more classrooms, so government needs to come up with more facilities um, based on where the demand is highest, and also come up with low-cost models to ensure that we can expand on the facilities, um, ensure that we have enough teachers that are available to teach this population. So that was emphasized in the report, but not to say that quality is being underplayed. Um, definitely we need good quality teachers um, to teach the population and the young people because when we look at growth and look at the, and look at the, the dividend, um, it's about having highly qualified and skilled population. That's true. Uh, that is when you benefit most um, from the young people. So okay. quality is not, uh, is not underplayed and is also uh, something that from the World Bank perspective we really focus on. All right. Angela. Thank you. The quality of education has to be looked at in perspective. Our economy um, and the basic, um, basically countries across um, the African continent, we geared towards a traditional approach in education. And this was pushing the population towards a classroom style of, of understanding, of learning. And in the end result was government uh, placed jobs, jobs that were more keen, the white collar jobs, should we say. Over the years, we've seen um, a change, and that's where pedagogy comes in. We have seen a change from this traditional way of learning because the demand for the jobs was not meeting the, the churning out of the numbers that we're actually studying. So we moved from um, a position where there were few, uh, there were many opportunities but few people in school, to now many who've studied and no opportunities out there. You can't have a bloated government. Um, government can only take so many employees. Which means we have a youth, a bloated youth, um, uh, that are lacking jobs and uh, unemployed. And the key thing on quality is then, are we turning out the right information now for this youth that are not able to use what they're studying in school to be able to create um, opportunity for themselves. The theoretical best learning is good to give you that grounding, but it may not necessarily <laughs> give you the grounding when it comes to um, practical Juakali work. We need to change our approach, um, and in private sector we are pushing for that, so that I can tell my, my daughter to learn carpentry and have the best furniture outlet and sell on the world market at, and sell on Amazon. And not be worried about not carrying the degree exactly. you know, from a recognized university. Exactly. So I think the mindset shift is key. It's really first and foremost. In, uh, when we were growing up, we were taught that some jobs were for a lower end caliber person. And today, these are the opportunities we are telling our youth to take up. But our youth look at them and they are not interested in them. You're asking a young boy who's grown up in an urban center to go and go back to agriculture and farming. They don't want to grab a hoe, but if it's mechanized, they will. So we need to change with the times. And once we do, we will then change the quality. Absolutely. So we need to go back to the basics on mindset and attitude change because skilling will then be easier. We won't be skilling somebody who's going to pocket the degree, the skilling degree for the sake of, of having it uh, because they are shy to be seen in this profession. I mean, now we have jokes on the internet with people saying, if you want to buy my degree from this university, it's for sale because I've failed to get a job. Alex, um, we have about 8 million youth of the 46 over 46 million Ugandans, are we able to measure their productivity? Uh, Josephine, that's a very good question, but I would like to uh, answer it uh, while taking into account what uh, my two friends here have talked about. Uh, because we need really to understand this concept of engagement of the youth. Because you see, skiing alone cannot make a person productive and employable. 
there are a host of other factors that are very, very critical. And, and for instance, we needed to appreciate the direction of government to first establish, put in place what we call a ingredients of the economy, the fundamentals of the economy. Because even when you talk about the classroom, you need electricity. That, that said, what we need and what we have not been doing, I think, as government of Uganda, but now we have really put our heads on it, is how do we scientifically study the productivity of Ugandans, the productivity of the youth? Because productivity must be planned, uh, and it cannot be generally you know, discussed. There must be a national structured institution, a national structured mechanism of studying productivity, because productivity varies with time and space. For instance, we, have, we are in COVID. The workplace have configured in terms of you know, standard operating procedures, others are working from home, you know, everything has changed. Then we need to come up scientifically and say what influences eh, productivity. And, and now, for us to do that, the government of Uganda has now initiated a very serious uh, intervention of putting in place a national productivity center. So the national productivity center will be responsible for studying and advising different sectors, private sector, you know, public sector, you know, categories of, uh, of population, say women association, on how best, first of all, what is their productivity status? Where do they stand? How do we compare ourselves with Singapore? How are we with the African average? So this intervention is the one that has been missing because as you know, uh, government has put substantial investment in ensuring that the youth and the young people are able to participate in the labor market. So now with this intervention, once it is actualized and which we are working on, is we inform us scientifically, even we will come to you to Josephine and want to see your productivity. How, how productive are you? Eh? Are, are you efficient? Are you really at optimal? Where, you know, what is the level and how do we compare? So that's, that one will be able now to engage the youth from a scientific perspective if, because if I, uh, I may be a skilled person, but I may, I may not have capital. When we speak about, and I know we're going to have some youth speaking to us about what their challenges are and uh, you know, s solving them, what that looks like. But one of the things that keeps coming up is young people lack opportunities. Sometimes because maybe they don't have the skill or because there's steep hurdles along the way, corrupt practices, and then you have bureaucratic obstacles impeding the upward mobility of, of many of the young people. What specifics can government do to become less of an obstacle and perhaps more of a catalyst for them? And this is not just to you, this is to all of us. Yeah, you see, for us government now, we are focusing on uh, having a public service that is dedicated and corrupt free. Because you know that one of our key strategies is the private sector led growth. So the private sector cannot grow if public institutions are not facilitating the private sector players to invest and do business. And that's why you see, for instance, we have special courts, right, and corruption. You know, come, you know, come in and you know, investigate you know, corruption, you know, practices, and prosecute. But also, most importantly, because we operate a decentralized system, we are now looking at supporting and strengthening local governments. These local governments help us so much in ensuring that the services are near to the people. Okay. So in once we strengthen this local government, once we improve the bureaucracy, we also had, by the way, uh, some roles that were impeding 
impeding business. So we are also looking at those laws. For example, for example, when you look at the business registration, you have to go to different institutions for you to get a license. And it takes you about you know, a week or, or a month or even six months. But countries like Singapore, in one hour you register business. So we are now looking at what are these laws okay. that are impeding business. And therefore also ensuring we motivate staff you have heard that, you know, for example, salaries of selected civil servants are enhanced, the allowances are enhanced. All of that is really to ensure that we have an efficient government that can support and deliver services required by the private sector. All right. Well, uh, Angela and Diana, well, tying this to the earlier part of the presentation and looking at the fact that agriculture seems to be, you know, one of the things that we're going to to give a lot of attention to Uganda's strong point. How can Uganda's youth leverage this unique benefit? Angela, you started speaking about how a lot of youth don't want to go back to picking up a hole, but they, they will if there's you know, some, a, a certain push factor. Could they perhaps use agriculture as a basis for robust economic growth? Yes, even before we, we go to agriculture, if I can just pick up on Alex's point, um, on the government investment. Uh, according to the World Bank statistics, if we look at our human capital index, a child born today in Uganda is only 38% as productive as they would have been had they received a full education and good health. So when we look at um, government's role as far as uh, developing human capital, the first one for me would be on increasing its investment in education because the investment uh, at the moment is about, education takes about 10% of the public expenditure. Now, if the human beings and the human capital are the most important asset that uh, a country has, then that is one area that we need to look at, um, increasing the investment in uh, education right. for starters, to increase our productivity from 38%. And when you speak about that, you take me to the point of health, and I don't want to lose the question that I'd asked, but you yeah. take me to health because for productive uh, youth, you need them in good health. And uh, Alex, I want you to speak about that a, a little later on what we are doing um, in terms of health and the youth uh, a little later. But yes, please proceed. So, so back to your question, when we look at the agriculture sector, um, and from the bank side, we're working a lot with government in education as well to see how we can improve the skills in the education sector, but particularly for agriculture. So we're supporting a number of colleges, like Bukalasa College, um, and supporting the BT Vet sector to see how can we skill the youth um, and give them modern skills, even in that area. Okay. The vocational education has not been attractive in the past, as Angela said, um, but there are efforts that we're working with, with government to promote vocational education as well, right. by supporting a number of colleges, um, by doing communication around skills. So in the recent years, you would see that government has increased its investment in skills, and agriculture is one of those uh, focus areas. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Angela. Yes, thank you. Uh, the, uh, Diana has alluded to the assistance World Bank is giving to um, skilling. I sit on the private sector foundation, uh, Uganda board. And uh, we have seen a lot of work done with World Bank on skilling Ugandans, um, especially on the vocational um, key areas. We have seen that the private sector um, initiatives are what are going to bring people back to those areas uh, in agriculture that they find quite, um, um, they don't feel that this is an up, it's something I should take on and do. We want, uh, of course, agriculture is our gold. It's Uganda's gold. And with 80% of the money and stuck within the agriculture sector, we then need to make it lucrative. When we talk about private sector-led um, skilling and raising of youth to be able to, to uplift them and raise their level of, of um, living, we need to get them excited about these areas. So we need to promote some of these. If we look at the last uh, 10 or so years, agriculture has been phased out in secondary schools. But if it's phased out and 80% of our e economy is depending on agriculture, 
then we need to modernize it. We need to change the way people are looking at, at um, agriculture. We need to also ensure that as we do, we look at the value chain. The value chain inclu includes um, agro-processing. To be able to get the youth to be engaged in agriculture does not mean we take on the traditional role of get a hoe and go and dig. It means mechanize. Even with our hilly terrain, we need to mechanize and therefore we need to invent um, innovations that work for our terrain. We shouldn't give up simply because we don't have prairies or low-lying uh, kind of land for agriculture. We should then push the Juakali associations to innovate. Now, if you want this to work, the people who give you the best ideas are not government. Government does the structural trans transformation. The youth that you want to get involved are the ones who give you the ideas on how they will go ahead. Now, how do you do that? You need to get the youth involved in strategy. Because when you put them at that strategic thinking level, the excitement is built from that point. But we are still having a, a push-pull kind of effect with government. We need government for infrastructure, but government does not move at the same pace as private sector. Mm -hmm. And I know the commission is listening <laughs> avidly at this. <laughs> the private sector moves very fast, and they are ready to leave um, a specific area if they feel this area is not moving or bringing me benefits. So they are forward moving and quick. That's We're right. not moving at the same pace. Right. So we need to get private sector led yeah. programs that are led by the youth, and then we will see new innovations. We will then be able to see growth in a totally new um, direction. When we're looking at dimensionality, we need to start changing the way we approach problems, and it should come from the youth led approach. It may be different, but it will be unique, and it will start boosting the, the youth to now work with government. We must work with government. And I think it's important that we start you know when they say catch them young when they're still children so that mindsets are open to things like this as opposed to your brain being filled with you know uh, yes i would like to thank angela uh, for really for bringing up that uh, suggestion that the government should move at the same pace uh, with the private sector but we need really to understand the context you know all the things we are discussing about we should be knowing that uh, we have about 68% of Ugandans in subsistence agriculture. Uh, and that's a problem because it means that you have majority of Ugandans only working for, you know, not for money, but for, for food. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you do that? You know, how do you do that is to ensure that actually the serious uh, infrastructure development projects are extended, water, electricity, roads, you know, to talk about the railway. And I also uh, recognize and appreciate the suggestion made by Diana of expanding uh, classroom uh, educational facilities. Now, once we are able to do that, then the next question comes in, it is very addition. And this is what the government has been. The government has put enough, uh, not enough, but substantial programs that support value additional functions. If you look at uh, agricultural development cluster project, I, I think even supported by World Bank, if you look at operational wealth creation, all these are aiming at ensuring that this 68, because the problem of Uganda is now this 68, how do we ensure that um, our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers that are in subsistence agriculture, 68% is reduced. Okay. Now, once that is done, then we are going to see a very vibrant uh, economy. We are going to see more changes, as Angela is talking about. And also, uh, we need to recognize two things that we've been grappling with, the issue of mindset. Mm? Mm -hmm. uh, and this mindset, we need to link it with work culture and ethics. Now, this also has been uh, seriously, uh, is being addressed through the community development and human capital development programs and uh, NDP3. So we expect to see a, a transformation of uh, the way how people behave towards work, the way how people uh, interact at work, and how productive they can be in order to improve their lives 
and you know contribute to the overall uh, overall development of the community. Right. Um, I, Alex, a question I wanted to ask you on, on health, because I think it's important that we speak about health as well in looking at um, the recommendations from the World Bank on key areas we need to focus on. So education and health for young people. What is the plan, uh, the government's plan for that? First of all, for a country to be prosperous, you must have what we call a productive and high quality population. And the young people, are part of our future, this country. In fact, when you look at, for me, where, whereas many people get disturbed that uh, uh, we have uh, a very huge useful population and therefore it's going to be a burden. On my part, I say this is an opportunity for us as long as we put in place serious interventions that are able to take up uh, the improvement areas that these young people are interested in. In, in, in participating. So the Ugandan government, first of all, even before youth, we have fundamental health programs, maternity protection programs. We have immunization that you must be health immunization programs for free. But also we have come on board and during this COVID and we have emphasized that you must, you must recognize that COVID is a global problem and COVID kills. And we have developed a response mechanism for COVID to ensure that the young people are not involved in activities that are centers of transmission of this COVID. On the other hand, we have what we would call non-communicable um, disease prevention strategy. And also that has been a problem, as you know, uh, because the living, you know, the living standards have kind of improved. So people do not want to walk. People don't want <laughs> to do exercise. But, uh, where do you where do you walk? For example, if I'm walking to and from work, it's it's hard enough with the you know the kind of infrastructure that we have. So some of these things even take away from us what we would want to do for ourselves. Well, well, uh, Josephine, you may talk about uh, Kampala here, but I'm very sure. I, when I am driving along in TV, I see very good Ugandans walking. And for me, I thank them for that because that's very important. So, you know, the non communicable diseases prevention strategy. So, we have it in place to ensure that reduce alcohol, issues of HIV, we have emphasized because that's, that's the only way that we can have a future Uganda that is bright once the youth are able to keep health and ensuring that they adhere to the advice given by the Minister of Health. Right. You spoke about uh, population, and I would like to bring in Angela and Diana here. So we have over 40 million people, uh, 46 million over, 46 million. And there's a projection of over 70 million in time, and after that, over 100 million. Are we, while you're excited about the numbers, I'm a, I'm a little scared, I'm, um, I should say, because I feel that we are growing faster than the resources that we have. Is this something that we should be thinking about? What is the way forward there? And I will ask you to start. Thank you very much, Josephine. Um, so yes, the numbers are growing. But what is most important is that the quality of the population is productive. So productivity, if that population is able to buy, if they're able to create jobs, if they're able to contribute to the economy, then we're in a safe place. Um, the challenge is that without that population receiving the health services uh, that he spoke about or without them receiving uh, good quality education, then yes, there's an issue there. Okay. So, so it's that investment and I think um, what the bank is emphasizing is that investment in education and health and skills to ensure that even though we have the population growing, this population can then contribute to the growth of the economy. All right. Angela? I think the growth of the population is an exciting thing. Exciting in terms of opportunity for the youth. So we know it will hit 106 million in, in 2016, right? That means I have to look around and ask if I'm a youth right now, that, in, um, that will be, what, 40 years from now? If I've got 1,000 shillings from 106 million people, 1,000 shillings. What is the opportunity I have there? If I have a product I can sell to even half, 
I mean, that's how soda and other products like that have gone viral across the country. So what opportunity do I have that I can sell at low cost to the majority and people are able to buy? So we have an opportunity to think outside the box. The issue of health and infrastructure, therefore, has to be addressed quickly. We are looking for ways to reach our communities so that the youth can be brought uh, to that level where they can, you know, have sustainability. Um, Uganda Women Entrepreneurs has um, over 36 chapters across the country. But we've seen in each chapter, each district, they have a specific unique item, unique to them. Northern region has shea butter, has the nuts, has um, their specific things in regions. So let's work together with government and work on a sectoral um, empowerment. If Bulisa has this, then work on giving them machinery in that area. If Palisa has this, work on that. If Kavale is on the mushroom growing area, then let's promote the mushroom, the youth. And then the youth can go into a competitive kind of setting, a setting where they know they have a market. We reduce the cost of doing business. We give incentive. Yeah. When I want my children to do housework, what I do is ask them, how best do you want to do it? Okay, what do you need? And then I give it to them. When it comes from them, they're excited to do it. We have a yoga now in place, so access to finance can be done on a sectoral uh, level. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we pose that same question on population to Dr. Jotha Musinguzi, who is the Director General of Uganda National Population Council, and let's hear what he said. Dr. Jotha Musinguzi is currently the Director General of Uganda's National Population Council, NPC, Previously, Dr. Musungizi was the Regional Director of Partners in Population and Development, PPD, Africa Regional Office, ARO, based in Kampala, Uganda. Dr. Musungizi is a public health physician. Uh, thank you for that question, an important question regarding uh, the fertility and uh, population growth of Uganda, uh, as well as the challenge of youth productivity. I want to begin by saying that uh, Uganda is at crossroads regarding its uh, population and uh, demographic challenges. Uh, why do I say this? Because uh, Uganda has started growing out of the real bad situation where we had very high mortality, so many people dying, when we had the very high fertility, uh, the number of the average number of children that women are producing, but also our population growth, which was not in tandem with our economic and development aspirations. Uh, since about 10 years ago, Uganda has started witnessing a decline in the mortality, for example, children who are dying in the 1990s we used to lose 122 children per uh, 1,000. Uh, but as we speak now, uh, this rate has gone down to 43 children per 1,000. No child should obviously die, but as, you, as Uganda can see, we are witnessing a downward trend, a decline in mortality. This is very important. This is, this is a good thing that uh, number of children dying has gone down and should continue to go down. Similarly, fertility has started also going down, as I said, uh, since about 10 years ago, this has started happening, in which case Uganda has uh, both an opportunity and a challenge. So that's why we are saying, as far as the demographic or population challenge of Uganda, Uganda is at crossroads. It is at crossroads because we can take the opportunity to use fertility and therefore gain from the age structure that would be more favorable for the labor market. If we reduce fertility, especially if we do it very well in an organized way, we can find that we reduce the number of dependents and we increase the bulge of the working population. The working population, once the bulges, once we give them the education, the skills, the entrepreneurial skills, they're innovative, then they can be the engine of growth in that respect. So jobs then become very, very important for that population. But if we do not do anything, uh, the crossroad is that there could be civil unrest, 
these young people may have no jobs. Uh, they, they don't have, they are not enjoying uh, good health uh, and they don't have skills to be innovative. Then this could become a challenge, what we call a demographic disadvantage. So this is why we are saying Uganda, we are at a crossroads regarding our fertility. And so my advice is that we must deal with the issue of fertility in Uganda. And the answer is to make sure that it starts declining fairly rapidly. And we at the National Population Council, we have put in place a policy and mechanisms to make sure that Uganda starts to benefit from uh, that uh, fertility decline in terms of having a demographic dividend. The demographic dividend is not automatic, it's an economic benefit arising out of if fertility comes down, then the country can benefit with uh, the demographic developments of the country as, as we move forward. So that is where we are, and uh, population growth obviously will come down once we reduce the fertility, because the population growth is mainly, in Uganda, is mainly driven by high fertility. At the same time, if we reduce fertility, then we find that it is of economic benefits to the women. The women benefit, their health improves, but also the health of their children. Uh, if we also use the family planning and the modern contraceptive, then we make sure that women are spacing their children and their benefits along the line. And of course, then we also have less dependency, child dependency in our country. Regarding uh, the second part of your question, in terms of uh, Uganda's youth productivity, uh, I should just say that uh, Uganda welcomes a bulge in the, in the youth, uh, the over, over youth. The, the youth in Uganda, is, uh, the size is increasing and it is welcome, but it also comes with uh, challenges. So it's an opportunity, but also a challenge. A challenge, why? Because these young people, uh, they need to have the necessary education, they need to have the health, they need to make sure they have access to uh, skills uh, so that they can become innovators, so that they can become entrepreneurs. And uh, if there are also uh, jobs for them, the private sector is a is uh, encouraged, is facilitated, is supported, is promoted uh, to make sure they promote jobs, then uh, the youth bulge in Uganda uh, becomes a, a great thing and that is what we are talking about, the demographic dividend, the, the dividend, the economic benefits that we can benefit as a country from the bulge of the youth uh, growth level. And so in this regard, uh, the challenge of, of the country is to make sure that there are policies which are going to promote the private sector to, to create the necessary jobs. In the next uh, five years or so, uh, as the population increases, as you know, we are now about 46 million people. Uh, another 40 years, we shall be 104 million. Uh, out of those, uh, uh, out of those the, we are realizing that uh, the job seekers are increasingly becoming more in the next five or ten years, we shall be having uh, one million people needing jobs every year. And uh, by the time we, we are 104 million, it would mean that 70% of our population is in the working age population. These are the groups that we are talking about. Uh, Uganda would be having 70 million people requiring jobs. Imagine if they are, all these had jobs, uh, good jobs, productive jobs, they would be able to really get out of poverty and in, indeed uh, drive the economy of the country. And so what we are really talking about is that the, the, the opportunity of the young people poses also a challenge, a challenge that requires that we deal with it. The demographic dividend of Uganda, the economic benefit arising out of the bulge in the population of the working population is not automatic. We must have good policies, implemented over a long time uh, to make sure that uh, the economy grows, uh, these people will be able to save and to invest in the economy and therefore become the engine of growth. So we welcome the youth bulge, but we also know that government and the private sector must continue to do what it takes in order to make sure that there is a enabling environment for these people to transform our society. Thank you.
All right, thank you. We, we're going to ask each of you to wrap up. What would you like us to take home from this conversation in investing in Uganda's youth uh, for the future? And I will start with you, Diana. What would you like us to take home from the conversation, your message to the youth and to the policymakers? Thank you very much, Josephine. I'll start with my message to the policymakers. Uh, for the policymakers, I would say that we need to increase our investment in the social services, particularly in education and health. Um, and for this, it's not government alone, but government also needs to partner with the non-state actors. Uh, and then my message for the youth is to be creative. Um, government has provided education services, and as the previous speakers have said, there are opportunities that will come because of the large numbers of the population. So the youth need to be creative and to look for opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Commissioner. Yes, uh, what I would like to say is that number one is that the uh, population is very key. And particularly that now we see that the projection point to about 100 uh, million Ugandans in the next uh, few years. That's the market. And that market is not enough. We need the integration. In fact, we need the entire Africa to integrate for us to ensure that we have enough market. Number two is that the government of Uganda has put in place a number of interventions for supporting the youth, both uh, from education perspective to access to financial services, to advisory services in terms of entrepreneurship. These interventions, please take, take, take advantage of these inter uh, interventions and ensure that you are able to reach to government service centers and obtain relevant information. If you can't, government has now improved. We are using what we call ICT to disseminate information. You access the websites, you will get to know what a number of uh, interventions are being implemented. And then lastly, the youth. If we need a secure Uganda, we need the youth that are ethically correct and that are health. So we need to look at how do we work on our mindset and our ethics towards work, and how can we productively uh, ensure that we follow, we follow, we follow the standards and the guidance that are being developed by both government and private sector players in ensuring that the world of work becomes productive and is supportive, you are able to derive an income and a livelihood. All right. Angela, thank you. Could you just summarize very briefly what you'd like to tell us in closing? I'd like the youth to take opportunity, run with it. I want them not to fear change. Let them think innovatively. Let them think differently. Let them get up and try, because the first step is trying. And once they get through the trying stage, then the sky is the limit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for taking the time to, to speak with us. Um, I would like to hand over all of this now to the country manager for the World Bank, uh, Tony, to wrap us up and launch the 16th World Bank Economic Update. So everyone, we've come to the end of the, of the panel. I hope you find the discussion as uh, interesting and stimulating and as informative as, as me. I'd like to thank our panelists. I'd like to thank uh, my colleague Rich, uh, and um, uh, colleagues Aziz uh, also for, for their presentations. Uh, coming back to the main point for this, our 16th uh, Uganda Economic Update, uh, the, the country is certainly facing um, a, a crisis right now. It's taken a big hit uh, with, uh, with the coronavirus, a huge impact on, on, on the economy. And uh, we've, we've discussed some of the key measures we think that the government can take uh, to help the country uh, cr climb out of, the, out of the current situation. Uh, so let, let me leave that with you. Also, looking forward to the future, uh, we think that Uganda has potential for a great, a very prosperous future. Uh, the population is growing. You have so many young people growing up. Uh, the key is to invest in those young people, in their education, in their skills, in their health. That is the future for, uh, for, for Uganda. So we welcome you. Thank you for joining us again. I do trust that you will read the report if you're interested to read further. A special thanks to Josephine for facilitating us uh, today and to all of our panelists. Thank you and uh, see you the next time. Mm -hmm.